we heard the police sirens, they sat around the corner from me and I got woken up and told that there'd been an accident and they were two of my close friends, so I ran around to see what happened. And they'd had their throat slit in their sleep. There's a lot of freedom, you know, when I was growing up. We were allowed to go out and play out all day and we'd come home when we were hungry and the kids would all come together and we'd play on the green and you know there it was a lot of poverty the dinners were very simple and there was a lot of stress for my mum because you know she was a single mum a lot of my childhood and there were five children i think the only time i felt it was when everyone else in class would have jumpers nice jumpers or they they had nice hair and they all seemed very together and they went on these holidays and they went to Disneyland and we didn't have any of that. Because we didn't have anything, we found all these really fun ways to make pocket money to buy sweets and, and stuff like that. We used to go to this uh, golf course near us, me and a lot of the kids from the estate, and we used to hide in the wood, on the edges of the woodland. <laughs> and we'd wait for the golfers to hit their balls and when the balls came near to us, we would run out, steal the balls, and then we would sell them to the hardware store. And I, I was really young. When I moved to secondary school, and I remember very clearly that's when my struggles with education and reading and, and math and everything other than art sort of really surfaced in quite a, a terrible way, and it brought on a lot of bullying. Uh, but by that point, it, you know, the, the group I'd then fallen into was in, into a lot of crime. So I kind of dropped out of school at 14 and really got into sort of hanging out with quite, uh, <laughs> it's funny, at the time you think you're hanging out with older kids and it's really cool and you're getting up to mischief, like I can hot wire a car in five seconds, you know, it's like I, I really was very good <laughs> at getting in small windows. I met these adults because they were drug dealers and they would come and sell to kids on the estate and they would bring beers and they would go into the shops and buy booze for us with our pocket money or money we'd club together. And I just felt like they were, were so cool. And then when they were telling us about their breaking into, you know, Woolworths and stealing tools and getting loads of money for it, I was like, can I come? And they were like, yeah, of course you can. And, you know, then the next day they turned up with nice trainers for me. And, you know, and then I had a boyfriend who was in his 20s. It's so seductive that you fall into it and you think then that you look older and you are older and it's everyone else treating you like a baby, not the fact that you are a baby. And my mum was devastated because, you know, she was a good woman. She just couldn't control me. And we had a lot of mental health in the household that my mum was struggling with a stepdad that had a psychiatric problem and lots of children and trying to hold down a job. And, and I just felt that I was putting her through so much pain. I'd been doing a lot of crime and I was always giving fake names and fake addresses. And if you said you were over 16, then the police wouldn't call home and check with your parents. I always said I was 16 and gave this date of birth, but there's always a different name. And there was, I got arrested and we had <laughs> reversed into a Woolworths in, a, in North Watford and we'd been stealing. <laughs> I was so naughty, oh my God. And we'd been stealing these tools to sell and all of a sudden the police arrived. And then we all kind of kicked off and everyone was running in different directions. And, you know, I put the police driver's car keys down a drain. And then I got grabbed and it was the same police officer that had nicked me the week before. And she was just like, I know who you are and that's not your name. And it just kicked off this chain of events of them with the fingerprints, looking into it. They found out that I'd had a lot of, I'd been arrested a lot and a lot of things that I'd gone to court for, that I'd never gone back for. A lot of these older men said, look, you know, they'd been in prison quite a few times before. So they were like, we're gonna do time. So a couple of them had decided they were gonna run away. And that's when they said, you should come with us because you don't wanna go to prison. Because if you go to a youth offenders, your life is gonna be over. And I think at that time, it was kind of like, well, I'm hurting my mum. I'm upsetting my, my siblings and I can't do anything right and maybe I could start again and I could run away with these guys and we could get a flat again. It's fantasy, you know, of, of a young kid. But in my head, I just felt like if I removed myself from the situation, everyone else would be better off. So we ran away to London to a, one of them had a family member in Brixton. So we went and stayed there for a while, but then the police started sniffing around and they were like, look, you can't come with us. You're too young. We're going to get in more trouble but we can get you into a hostel. 
So I was dropped off at a hostel in Soho and they were like, just say you're 16, give a fake name and they will totally help you out. So that didn't last long because I didn't have any ID. But I'd started to, I'd met through the, in the reception there, some kids that were hanging out with homeless people that were teenagers that were hanging out in a park nearby. They'd all come from youth offenders, broken homes, foster homes, abuse, or they had got in with gangs as well. So there was a lot of people that had ran away from something but found each other. But I, I remember there was a woman called Molly and she was a nurse, like she had been a nurse and she had just had, her husband had an affair left her, she was American and she um, had become an alcoholic and then she'd lost everything, had a mental health breakdown and she was now on the streets on the Strand. You know, we slept in parks, we slept in doorways in Soho. Um, you know, the reason a lot of us slept in doorways on the main roads is because you have passing traffic, which minimizes the attacks. You still get attacked, but you can generally scream for help and someone will come. People were beaten to within an inch of their life. And it just, you know, the, the reason people sleep in public places is, to, is for safety. So we generally take drugs through the night and we'd be out and we'd be begging for money to get some food for the next day or to maintain our habits. and and we'd try and not sleep at night. And obviously as the drug, um, the drug addiction took hold, it's like your kind of morals slip away and you find yourself trying to find money, whether it's stealing and selling things and pickpocketing and or taking handbags and selling them to people. And, and you know, so it'd be like this chaos in the day to make money and then taking drugs all night to stay up and to um, keep out of trouble. But when you are surviving and you're that desperate, you will say whatever you can say in order to get that next hit that takes away all the pain or to, to get through the day or to get, you know, like food was always the last thing on our minds. It was just actually trying to feel soft and, and, uh, and happy. Did you miss home at that point? I did miss home, but I was really... So when I first ran away, it was like, I did miss my family. I missed my kid sisters. I missed my brother and my mum. But I also felt like I'd done so much and I'd hurt everyone so much. And I really felt like there was nothing to go back to. I think the shame was much bigger than the missing. And I'd, you know, the longer you leave it, the harder it feels to go back. And that was like a massive part of what kept me there for longer. And during those moments, like how, how did you kind of keep hopeful and what was it like kind of trying you to... You don't feel hopeful. The, the more abuse that started to happen or the sort of attacks that would happen to me and the girls, the kind of, the harder the drugs you would seek out to kind of make yourself feel better. You kind of go through extended periods of time, losing track of time, but also losing all of the friends that you have to overdoses. You know, I lost friends that were murdered, um, a lot of suicide, and it's just, it stops becoming fun and it just becomes about survival. And how did you find out about your friends? I saw, I, I was there. We heard the police sirens, they sat around the corner from me and I got woken up and told that there'd been an accident and they were two of my close friends, so I ran around to see what happened. And they'd had their throat slit in their sleep. It all came crashing down when I had a, a failed um, attempt to end it. And in the hospital, they recognized me from a missing poster. And it was probably the best thing that ever happened to me because they arrested me and they sent me home. My mum, you know, had to find me in a horrifically drug addicted state, completely battered. Um, but she said, you know, we can, we can get over this. And I was all of a sudden thrown out into the real world. And I, I still hadn't dealt with the root cause of everything that it led me to running away, but what happened. So no matter what it was that I that happened to me, and I've been very lucky in life, I would always relapse. So I just kind of crashed through life for a couple of years. And then I got pregnant with my first child when I was um, a teenager. It's like, you know, it was, I worked as a, um, a table dancer because it's like I didn't think you could be anything and I wanted to earn money because I wanted to get out of the hostel I was living in with my daughter because it was it had a lot of addiction in it and I didn't want to relapse but then by doing that I ended up relapsing on drugs because I felt 
so little self-worth. I um, met someone who I was working in a pub across the road from a recording studio and I met bands that were recording in there and really got in with kind of like filming and photographing this band and through that I met a musician who was an ex-addict and they had had similar elements to their childhood as I had and they had lost everything several times over and they could understand like the pain that I'd been living and he just became a big mentor and you know even two years later I had another relapse and I had a relationship fall apart and I'd lost custody of my daughter and and him and his girlfriend were like well we've got a flat in London you don't you, I was in a hostel again and they were like you can't stay in a hostel you're not going to be homeless you're going to be a filmmaker and you can stay there for a couple of years until we sell it and that is our gift to you don't mess it up and it was the Nobody had ever given me that kind of chance before. I had somewhere to live, and that really was the beginning of this life, you know, as a filmmaker. And how long were you homeless for, Lorna? Um, I was on the streets for about 18 months, but it was like two years of kind of like back and forwards and not being at home and stuff like that. But then I was also homeless as a single mum in hostels and temporary accommodation and not having secure housing for nearly 11 years. So it's like, you know, people like to talk about street homelessness, but actually, Homelessness affects so many people and it's the not having somewhere safe and secure that you can sleep at night. And what things can we do to tackle homelessness? It's completely possible to end homelessness, build more social housing, put funding into wraparound therapeutic care for people that have been placed in housing. And it's putting more money back into mental health and drug addiction services. Why was it important now to sort of tell your story and why do you think making a film about homelessness is, is so important? So Someone's Daughter, Someone's Son, it came about in lockdown and I'd been asked quite a lot actually to make a film about homelessness after people found out about my past. But then it became this fascination, I think people are fascinated with like the gory bits instead of going actually, you know, let's talk about this long journey it took after that trauma and all these failings and mess ups I made and why to get to where I am. And I'm so lucky, but it's like I still carry that sort of shame or that less than feeling that I really have to work on. And for me, the only reason that I talk about my life now is because I just want to tell anyone that's feeling like their life isn't going to go on. It's like, it does. And there were so many moments in my life that I really didn't want to be here. And um, if any of that had succeeded, I wouldn't have felt the beauty that I feel now. He looked young, he did look young, but it was after the, the marriage that I knew that he was twice my age, so I was 15, he was 30. I knew, I knew he was gonna rape me, and that's what happened. And it, it became like every single day, 